Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, Anti-Corruption and Third Parties, Examining Third-Party Pitfalls and Best Practices and Aligning People, Process, and Technology. This is Devin Simonson from Source Intelligence, and I will be moderating today. Before we get started, we have some general housekeeping to go over. All PowerPoint slides and a video of this webinar will be available shortly after we conclude at sourceintelligence.com forward slash webinar library. Additionally, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the GoToWebinar control panel. We will send a follow-up email with responses after the webinar. Here's a quick look at today's agenda. We will cover global and local implications of corruption and business impacts of legal frameworks. Next, some third-party red flags and processes in prevention of corruption and bribery. And lastly, discussing how aligning people, process, and technology is the next wave in fighting corruption and how data helps with this. First, we will hear from Leslie Benton. Leslie Benton is the Vice President of Advocacy and Stakeholder Engagement of Create.org. Ms. Benton is a former Senior Vice President of Levick Strategic Communications, where she led the anti-corruption and compliance communications practice. A lawyer by training, Ms. Benton is widely recognized for her experience in navigating the complex legal and regulatory landscape for NGOs and Fortune 500 companies in addition to her expertise in corporate compliance and governance, anti-corruption reform, and trade and policy. Next we have Craig Moss. Craig Moss is Chief Operating Officer of Create.org, where he is responsible for developing Create Leading Practices, a program designed to help companies and their suppliers reduce the risk associated with trade secret theft, counterfeiting, piracy, and corruption. He has developed definitive guides for organizations including World Bank Group's International Finance Corporation and the United Nations. And lastly, I have myself, Devin Simonson. I'm the Anti-Corruption Services Senior Manager. I have years of experience building cloud-based systems to optimize operational efficiencies of industry leaders. I have extensive knowledge at building solutions for global brands, managing their third-party business partners, and I have been involved with the technology industry for the past five years. Thank you, Devin, for that introduction. We thought we'd start off today's um, discussion with some context setting about the problem that corruption poses for companies around the world today. Um, go a little bit into um, the legal architecture and then get right to the heart of what we're going to be talking about today, which is you know, how to work with your third parties to mitigate and address risk. So you know, we all know by looking at any newspaper headline that corruption risk is a very significant risk for companies doing business anywhere in the world today. And you know, looking outward, we see no sign that that risk will be abating. And we certainly don't see any abatement in the response that enforcement authorities are taking to the reality of corruption. In the United States, enforcement of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act continues at, an, at a very aggressive pace. Last year, 2014, was um, another uh, significant year for enforcement. There were 10 corporate resolutions brought by the Department of Justice and the SEC, or both together. Um, we, see, we saw last year three of the, uh, or actually two of the current top 10 largest settlements. You see them here, Alstom and Alcoa. The DOJ and the SEC together collected about $1.5 billion in FCPA recoveries and I think there were 14 individual actions as well. Um, the other thing we know, however, is that the United States isn't alone in these efforts any longer. Um, we've seen actions in Brazil related to the Petrobras scandal and also to um, uh, prosecution of eight individuals associated with the Embraer, um, the airline company. We see um, activity in China China brought its first bribery case last year against GlaxoSmithKline. Um, we see activity in Europe, Norway, uh, Netherlands, the UK, Germany, the list goes on and on. So, um, you know, we see activity increasing across the globe. In addition to governments, something that I find really interesting in this space is the activity of the multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, 
which operate primarily in emerging markets, but they're now routinely conducting anti-corruption investigations of bank-funded projects with really um, significant impacts for companies, including debarment um, and referral of cases to country enforcement authorities. The Alstom case, for example, um, involved very close cooperation between the United States Department of Justice and the World Bank um, in that case. So we're seeing um, just more and more activity. Again, the risks to companies aren't evading, and so in this environment, it's essential for companies to ensure that they understand and can effectively address their corruption risk. In terms of the business impacts for corruption, in addition to the, the legal impacts that I've mentioned just now, uh, one of the top concerns really is just that the disruption to business operations can be quite significant. We also see companies being open to continued extortion. Uh, we see time and time again when companies are known as those that will pay a bribe, the, the requests just don't stop coming. I mentioned exclusion from World Bank and other multilateral development bank contracts, but the same is true with regard to public procurement, government contracts. Um, and the reputational harm that companies can face is quite significant as well. Craig, Leslie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I was just going <clears> to <throat> highlight the issue of the disruption. You know, business continuity is such an important issue for companies now. And proceedings related to corruption cause huge disruption in business huge amount of drain in terms of senior management time and focus, plus the actual nature of the relationship with the third party involved typically comes to a halt. So if it's a key supplier, that can really hurt on the supply chain side. If it's a key agent or dealer, that can have direct impact on revenue. So business continuity really suffers both during the investigation and then of course at the out at the end, once the findings are are uh, released, and I think it also bears keeping in mind that corruption can happen in any market. Um, we see here the heat map from the Transparency International 2014 Corruption Perceptions Index, which, um, as you see, shows that you know companies are experiencing solicitation and extortion. Uh, public sector corruption in almost every market where one would expect to see companies operating, both developed and developing. So at this point, with um, the corruption risk so widespread and, as we will talk about in a minute, country response is really globalized, company, I'm sorry, country, yes, country response is really globalized, um, it's more important than ever that, that companies put good programs in place. So we thought we'd talk for just a minute about the legal framework, not going into too much detail. I'm going to assume that most of you in the audience today understand the legal framework, but for those of you who may not or for whom this may be new, I'm going to give a very brief overview. Um, as I said just a minute ago, almost every country has prohibited bribery and other forms of corruption in their domestic law. Um, the US FCPA has been in effect since 1977, for example. Um, but, you know, since the early 2000s, we've seen the adoption and implementation of international legal treaties, such as the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, and also the UN Convention Against Corruption. And since then, we've really seen the globalization of, of these laws. The UN Convention, for example, has been ratified by more than 170 countries to date. Again, just illustrating um, that there's really nowhere left to hide. Um, in terms of their application, of course, two of the international laws are of most importance to companies, the FCPA and the UK Bribery Act, which went into effect a few years ago. Uh, both of those laws apply extraterritorially, that is, um, outside their home country, so they have very, very broad reach. And, you know, in terms of application, we do see the U.S. authorities regularly applying the FCPA to U.S. and foreign companies for bribery paid almost anywhere in the world. 
And you know, we haven't seen a lot of activity in the UK under the UK Bribery Act thus far. Um, we are starting to see some activity, but we do know that those offenses within that law, the corporate offense, has jurisdictional elements that are arguably even broader than the FCPA. So really, really, really wide reach. Um, Brazil has also enacted a law. It does also have some extraterritorial application. Um, China has um, adopted a foreign bribery law that's very similar in some ways to the UK law and the US law. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, China has strengthened some of the provisions of that law. Uh, the other thing that we see, I think, and it's been an effect of the anti-corruption treaties, but also just this sort of explosion of um, enforcement activity, is that prosecutors and regulators from different countries are increasingly working together um, to, to bring cases to conclusion. You know, we have seen examples of that in um, Brazil. You know, the Brazilian and U.S. authorities have worked very closely, both on the Embraer case and now with the Petrobras investigation that is ongoing. Uh, the Alstom case, uh, which was against you know, a French company, included um, this sort of cross-border cooperation. And in fact, uh, the Justice Department officials rel you know, regularly speak about the fact that almost all cases ongoing today include some um, level of international uh, cooperation um, and you know, work together. Um, I'll talk just a minute about some of the common features of the anti-bribery laws that I've just mentioned. Um, you know, I've I've gone over the extraterritorial um, nature of these laws, applying outside the borders of the country, enacting them. Most of the laws include both criminal and civil offenses. Um, all of them cover bribery of a foreign government official, but the UK Bribery Act and the Brazil Clean Company Act also cover domestic and commercial bribery. Um, company to company bribery. They prohibit paying bribes through third parties, which is very important for our discussion today. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. And they apply both to corporate and individual acts, with individuals facing significant jail time for violations, certainly in the United States. And if anybody's been watching the news um, this week, we've seen the Justice Department issuing new guidelines on those individual prosecutions. So I don't expect to see that um, abating anytime soon either. So some key takeaways from all of this, I think we can expect to see continued aggressive enforcement in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, I think we can see you know, continued focus on both companies and individuals, continued cross-border enforcement and cooperation, Scrutiny of compliance programs, when we're talking about corporate um, prosecutions, you know, we're certainly talking about the level of effectiveness of your program. And then third parties as a very significant risk for companies. Um, I know uh, last year of the 10 cases that I mentioned that were resolved in 2014, nine of those cases involved third parties in some form or fashion. And according to the OECD, OECD bribery report that was released last December, which looked at all cases that have been brought by OECD member company countries in the last decade, more than 70% of those uh, involve third parties as well. So just a huge, huge risk area for companies. So I think now we'll go on to get really to the heart of our discussion today. And Craig, do you want to do you want to lead this one off? Sure. So the first thing to think about from a company standpoint is think about all the third parties that you deal with as an organization. And these can range really, as it mentions here, from agents or distributors or resellers or dealers on the sales side, but also upstream parties can be involved in this. Each of you also probably have other types of relationships with transportation companies and freight forwarders, with law firms and accountants and in addition a lot of companies now have different types of subsidiaries or joint ventures or equity stakes in other companies around the world you as an organization are liable for the actions of each of these third parties and that's something that we cannot stress enough you are liable for the actions of that agent and if they are bribing an official a lot of the complexity of the third parties that you deal with, 
you think about the way that in different countries bribery takes place, and then you think about the reach of the laws now, all of this creates a highly, highly risky situation for companies that are operating around the world. So what we want to do now is just kind of get you thinking broadly about the types of third parties. In some countries, Leslie and I were on the phone with a company recently, and they said that law firms in their country were a very, very common way that bribes would be paid to government officials. So you might not think about that as a, as a risk area, but you do need to start to, to look at who the third parties are and then now we're going to talk to you a little bit about some of the steps to try to identify where you should put your resources to reduce your risk. Uh, exactly. Um, and I just want to underscore something that Craig said, which is, you know, we, we really have to think broadly about your third parties. And, you know, before you start um, determining that some will invoke more risk for you than others. Just really, really think broadly about this because I think for purposes of this discussion, you have to think that almost any of your business partners can potentially create legal liability for the company. Um, but of course, the risks are going to vary. So um, as you're thinking about putting a process in place to manage um, this issue. Your goal should be to develop a sort of road map, and that's what we see on this slide, for due diligence that won't sort of mire your company in costly bureaucracy, but at the same time will provide you with a consistent, credible, and repeatable process that will help you form, you know, a real evidence-based view on whether to proceed or or to continue with the relationship if it's ongoing. And the first thing that you should really think about when you've sort of gotten an inventory of your third parties is, you know, what kind of risk they present to you. And so thinking about that, using your risk assessment processes to um, risk rank third parties. Some companies like to bucket them into high risk, medium lit risk, low risk, red, yellow, or green. But um, putting them in categories will then help you figure out how much due diligence to perform on each party. You know, obviously someone who is supplying um, paper goods or other materials to your company will cause less risk than an agent or a distributor or someone who's helping you with customs, for example. So it's very important to start the process with a risk ranking um, so that then you can figure out the time and attention that you need to devote to each type of third party. Because one thing that we do know, at least in the United States, is that the, the DOJ and the SEC expect to see a thoughtful risk-based approach to management of third parties. And then the next stage is really to start to communicate to the third parties. So this is where your policies come into play and the idea that you have senior management commitment. There should be some kind of consistent communication from your organization to all of the third parties. Similarly, if you think about other types of supply chain compliance issues, similar to having a supplier code of conduct, what is the expectation that you have related to their behavior regarding corruption? So that communication needs to be consistent and it should be coming from people in your organization that are senior enough that they command the attention of the third parties. And I think it also bears in mind mentioning here that it's very important to consult your local or in-house counsel regarding uh, local law and local restrictions on due diligence. And there are certain um, geographies where it is much more difficult to do due diligence than others, where you have to be um, aware of local um, privacy laws, labor laws, other restrictions on collecting certain types of information, uh, perhaps requirements to have consent from the third party before proceeding. So, and, and that just varies widely, it's far too widely to have um, a detailed discussion about that today. But just remember that uh, consulting local counsel and, and understanding those restrictions is something really important to do before you move on to the next step, which is collecting data. 
Um, there are lots of ways that companies do this. Again, um, probably too much uh, to go into great detail today, but most companies use a tiered approach to collecting data depending upon the risk ranking that any particular third party receives. Um, certainly, most companies start with sort of open source screening, conducting background checks, using simple questionnaires, perhaps internet and media searches, um, looking, and this is very important, at sanctions and restricted party lists, but you know, sort of using the kind of public data that is available to any of us um, before moving forward. I mean, that's certainly uh, one level of information. Um, for riskier third parties, those that you've put into the sort of medium or um, high risk categories, you'll want to go a little bit more in depth. Um, you may use a more in depth questionnaire, which you'll need to validate. Um, many companies will use um, in person interviews, reference checks. Certainly, you can do a deeper dive into public records. Um, and also, something really important, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is, is ensuring that you have looked at that company's own policies and procedures, their own anti-corruption program. Uh, because one of the things that companies often ask in the due diligence process is to, you know, a company to certify that they will comply with the law and with policies, but they haven't gone through the process in the due diligence to determine that the company has the capacity to even live up to that certification. So ensuring that you've taken a look at the kind of policies and procedures and training and monitoring that your third party has in place is, is very, very important. And then one other thing I'll say before I pass it back to Craig is that certainly for the very most high-risk third parties, you'll want to do a much more extensive investigation. You may want to use outside consultants. Uh, you may want to interview a wide range of employees and business partners to get a real uh, complete look at that at that party. Um, but all of this, whether it's for the most, you know, a lower risk or a higher risk partner, um, is part of the data collection process and the validation process. Craig, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, sure. We can from there. I mean, as as Leslie mentioned, you're at that point you want to identify the red flags that are coming up. Where are there areas that of concern? And if we start to look at some of the specific red flags that that we recommend you think about is was that third party recommended by a government official? This is really common in a lot of countries. You go in and there's a government procurement uh, bid coming up and somebody in the government says, you know, for you to get a really good chance at winning this bid, we suggest you work with XYZ consulting firm. That's a red flag. It doesn't mean you should never work with that firm, but it does mean that it should require some additional due diligence on your part. Of course, reputation is critical. Do they have a reputation for unethical conduct in that country? Have they been terminated by other companies? If so, why? These are the types of things that you need to probe into to be able to understand the nature of that organization and how they would fit into your business objectives in that country or in that transaction. Lack of experience is, is sort of a classic thing in a lot of cases. If you look at a, a, an agent or a consultant and they have no experience in your industry, but yet they are recommended by somebody that you really need to use them, that is a red flag in and of itself. Why would you need that person if they don't know anything about your industry or ho have no track record in your industry? And finally, large frequent political contributions is another type of red flag that would come up that would cause you to want to take a deeper look. Again, it doesn't prohibit you from working with them. You should just go into it with your eyes open, having done an appropriate level of due diligence based on the risks and then the red flag. Another red flag would be to look at whether the 
third party is a large or frequent contributor to political parties or to politicians in that country. Obviously, this can be a sign that they are looking for ways to influence politicians in that country. Again, it doesn't mean that you can never work with these organizations if there's a red flag. It just means that you need to conduct the appropriate level of due diligence to address the risk and make sure that you're going into the relationship with your eyes open and aware of the risk that they would face. Um, and a sort of another set of issues that you may want to think about is, you know, whether the company is willing to cooperate in your due diligence process. If they aren't, that in, its, in itself is a red flag. And I think I would hear, say here, um, also if you're doing due diligence and you don't find any information on a company, that is a red flag as well. So if they're not willing to give it to you, um, if they're not willing to cooperate, or if you go out there on your own and don't find any information related to that company, that is a huge red flag, or those are huge red flags. You know, you'll want to look at the identity of the owner if they're not willing to give that to you. That's a red flag. What you're looking for, of course, are you know contacts with government officials. You want to make sure that there, there is a real owner, um, that these aren't fictitious companies um, that are set up. So you need to you know ensure that you have that information. You want to make sure that they'll sign a contract with you. Uh, Craig and I have um, talked to companies that have um, many relationships that are done simply with a handshake because their third parties don't want to sign contracts. That's certainly a problem. And you want to make sure that in those contracts that you get appropriate protections. And so if your third party is unwilling to make um, or to provide adequate invoices and document expenses, those are huge, huge problems. Uh, just a, a, a moment on audit rights. You know, in a perfect world, you should have the right to audit all of your third parties. We know that it's difficult to get. Many third parties aren't willing to give audit rights in contracts. Um, that in and of itself may not be a red flag, uh, but it's something that you should certainly think about. In terms of payment issues, some red flags to look at here would be if they require an unusually high commission. This can often be a sign that they need to spread some of that money around and share it with others that maybe are behind the scenes that you're not aware of. If there's some kind of substantial upfront payment request or insistence on payment in cash, all of these would be clear red flags that you should be concerned about. And then, um, you know, as Craig has mentioned before, red flags aren't necessarily a death knell to the relationship, but rather they are signs that there are issues that you have to assess and more questions that need to be answered. So, you know, some of the things that you can do to clear the red flag is to discuss the situation with the company and get more information. You know, just have a, have a dialogue. Sometimes you'll actually be able to get the information that you need to get comfortable just by um, better and more consistent and frequent communication. You want to review the validation steps that you've already taken to make sure that you've dotted all of your I's and crossed your T's. And here you just want to make sure that you have a consistent and transparent process in place. Um, you can strengthen your contracts. You know, we've talked about getting compliance representations and warranties, which I don't think anyone thinks are sufficient in and of themselves, but it's something that you should have to protect yourself. You might, instead of having um, an annual certification, you might want to get um, more frequent certifications. You might want the compliance representation to be more specific than sort of the general representation that we often see in contracts. Maybe something that's very specific to the problem that you found. Um, you know, you, you can certainly undergo more, more frequent monitoring or sort of spot checking of the company if you do decide to go forward. And another thing that companies can think about is providing training and capacity building to um, ensure that whatever problem you found is one that has been identified, addressed, and won't um, be repeated again. Um, through all of this, you know, you want to make sure, as I said, that you've got a consistent 
transparent process, that you're not making too many exceptions to that process, and certainly that you're getting the kind of approvals to go forward that you need, that you're keeping documents, um, that you're going to the, the whatever level of the company you need to go to to ensure that the proper decisions are made about continuing with or you know, entering into a new relationship with a third party. Um, and I guess I said it before, but I, I can't stress enough, just ensure that you document, document, document this process. Um, if there are questions that come up later in the future with this third party, you want to make sure that you've got um, a, a valid and um, defensible reason for having gone forward um, that you can evidence through, through documentary um, means. So some of the top tips. <clears throat> to really think about here is one is we've stressed so far is do your due diligence cannot stress that enough it's important it's important that it be documented it's and that's one of the reasons that create and source intelligence teamed up is that they provide some of the technology that you can use <clears throat> to be able to document a wide dispersed supply chain or a wide number of third parties located in different places around the world in addition to that, using contracts wisely is really critical. And Leslie's mentioned several points about that, but one of the things in there that uh, I'll uh, highlight and then turn this one back to Leslie is that you can start to add certain type of requirements in your contract that the third party conduct internal training or that they conduct internal monitoring or that they have some kind of anti-corruption program or management system in place. These are all critical things that you can do in the contractual framework that starts to help embed anti-corruption into how that company operates, how that third party operates. Leslie, you want to add on the contracts? No, actually I think you said that really well. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and address the next point, which is the communication and training. You know, one of the things that's so important with regard to third parties is that each third party have a business relationship manager, someone within your company who's responsible for that relationship. And, you know, very often we see that companies themselves aren't training their own employees on how to interact with third parties. So, so that's another thing that you can do to ensure that you're managing your third parties wisely is to ensure that you've trained your own employees on how to do that, how to conduct the due diligence, how to ensure um, a smooth uh, relationship, how to, how to monitor them, um, both for just the the business aspects of the relationship but any corruption aspects as well so training your own employees is key and then as Craig mentioned training your third parties either requiring that they do the training themselves or having training for those third parties and we're seeing this more and more um, we see some large companies who have even made training modules available on their websites we know that some will go in and do in-person training for high-risk third parties, but you know, ensuring that you're getting your message across is probably the first and last thing that you should be doing with these companies. So that is incredibly key. Um, the the next thing that's key is again, we've said it before, but to monitor them, to ensure that the contract is being um, complied with, that your anti-corruption requirements are being complied with that you're seeing the proper kind of um, expense reporting and disbursement. Um, that is probably the, the key and the one thing that we see companies not doing enough of. Yeah, that's, that's right, Leslie. I mean, monitoring is really the weakest area that we see globally. A lot of companies get to the contract stage, they sign the contracts, and then they kind of lose sight of the compliance related issue. They focus around the business issue in that contractual relationship and lose sight and they're not monitoring the compliance or corruption related issue. So that's a huge problem that we see and an area that companies can really um, strive to improve in. And of course that leads to enforcing and improving. So you monitor, 
you find a problem, what do you do? Well, one, of course, you need to deal with the incident that you discovered, and you want to do that in an effective, consistent way. What are the remedies that you have? But beyond that, you want to be able to look at what caused that problem. What is the root cause of that problem, and what could you do to change your system to keep it from happening again? So, for example, if you find that there's a consistent problem with excessive gift giving in one of your regional offices, is that the result of a policy that is uh, really not realistic, like maybe too strict a policy or the amount doesn't work in that country? Or maybe it's a result that there's no clear procedure and that the people in that country feel that it's too burdensome or they don't really know what to do. Is it a result of a lack of training? Maybe they don't know that that's the policy. So these are the types of things that you can do to start to look at the, the causes. Because ultimately what we want to try to do is have an organization eliminate some of the repeating problems. So you start to create more clarity. You start to create more systematic way that anti-corruption behavior is embedded in your organization and how your organization deals with third parties. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk in a little more detail about the actual processes that a company should have in place to prevent corruption. And, you know, as context for the discussion that we're about to have, just very quickly, you know, at this point in the evolution of anti-corruption law and sort of the compliance um, industry, if you will, there is a global consensus uh, about what a good compliance program looks like. And there's certainly global consensus about what regulators want to see when they're looking at your compliance program should you find yourself in that situation. And we mentioned some of the guidelines here. You, you can um, find them all on the internet. And they've all formed the basis of the framework that we'll describe to you next, which is the framework of the, um, the assessments that, that we would um, use for companies in our own work and that we, we would expect to see um, in place um, as a good compliance framework in any company. So <clears throat> when we get down to it now, what are the parts of the management system that make up a good anti-corruption program? And there are really seven different parts or processes that should take place. Number one would be policies, procedures, and records. Really foundational. What are the policies or rules that your company has around these issues. What is the gift giving limit? Do you pay facilitation payments at what level? What are the circumstances at which you would terminate somebody? These are policy related issues. Beyond that would be procedures. What are the instructions provided to people for following the rules? And then finally, what records are kept? So the next category is any corruption compliance team. And, and here we're looking to see who in the organization has responsibility for managing corruption, developing the program and implementing that program, making sure it's actually followed in the company. Um, we also look at uh, senior management level involvement. Um, and we look at whether a company has siloed anti-corruption management in one department or whether they're looking cross-functionally um, and drawing in those resources to ensure that the program is actually implemented effectively. The next category is looking at the risk assessment. So we've talked about the risk assessment is really a foundational piece to your overall program. And what we would look at here is the maturity of that process. Is it done consistently? What are the factors that it consists that it considers? Does it actually get into risk ranking, which we talked about before? So that's the next that category that we look at there is risk assessment. And the next category, management of supply chain, is really about what we've discussed today. It's ensuring that you're doing appropriate due diligence on your third parties. It's ensuring that you are communicating with them in a way that is effective so that they understand and can follow 
your anti-corruption requirements, and they can ask questions if they have them. So making sure open communication chains are, are, are channels are there. Um, it's about using your contracts wisely. Um, and the last few categories um, harken back to what Craig just said a few slides ago, thinking about training both your own employees and third parties monitoring and measuring your program. I think Craig said earlier you can't improve what you don't measure and it's certainly true with anti-corruption. You need to make sure that you're monitoring and not just your third parties but really your entire program. Over time are you looking at it on an annual or some sort of regular basis to ensure that it's up to date, that it works, that it's effective. So in, in every one of these categories. And then finally are you taking the kind of corrective action that you should based on the information you get from your monitoring. Certainly if you have an incident you take care of it, but are you doing that kind of measurement annually or periodically then using that information to fill gaps when you find them because the ultimate goal for this kind of a management system or any other is continual improvement. You want it to always improve, you want it to be addressing new risks as they arise, um, changes to your business model, new um, transactions that you enter, new types of third parties, new geographies. Uh, so, you know, this program has to be a, a living and breathing thing. And I should just, before I turn it back over to Craig here, is just to say, you should have this in place in your company, and this is the kind of thing you should be looking to see if your third parties have in place as you're doing your due diligence. Because this will tell you if they have the capacity to live up to the representations that you're asking them to make in your contracts. Absolutely right, Leslie. And and for most of the companies that are listening to this, there are aspects of your organization that are already using a management system approach and a continual improvement approach in other parts of your business. It could be quality management. It could be environmental issues. It could be occupational health and safety. But the idea of using a continual improvement cycle and using a management system approach to address issues has been something that is embedded more and more in companies. And we want you to take that approach in how you deal with your anti-corruption program, both internally, and then how do you cascade that to the third parties that you work with around the world. So what we do with Create Leading Practices is we would look at each of those categories and look at the maturity level that you as an organization or your third parties would have in each of those. And just to highlight a couple things on this slide, one, as you work your way up from one, which is basically a, a very immature system, to a five, the thing I want to highlight is the idea of system development and implementation. Very different things. The development could be the documentation or the structure of it. The implementation would be, are people actually following the procedures? So if you have a training program, it's one thing to have a training, a guideline for training or to have training materials, but then to check to see if people are doing the training on an annual basis. Are you keeping records to make sure that the training is conducted? These are all parts that become signs of a more mature process and we would look at that in each of the seven categories. So the way that our program uh, works and uh, in coordination with Source Intelligence is that Create Living Practices starts with a self-assessment and a company goes through and would answer a series of questions, uh, multiple choice questions that would in, in generate a score, a maturity score in each of those seven categories. Then we would have experts like Leslie that would conduct an independent evaluation. So that would be done through a, an interview and a document review to provide a second score. Because what we often see is that the self-assessment scores can be quite inflated. Uh, either because a company doesn't quite sure what they do or because they're trying to make a positive impression on somebody. There are different reasons why, but ultimately it's that independent evaluation score that provides credible information. And in all supply chain issues now, and, and one of the things that, that we like about working with source intelligence is that companies are seeking transparency 
and visibility into their supply chain, but they're also seeking credibility. How do you have credible information on the third parties? And that's why it's kind of a nice combination with source intelligence because their technology provides that visibility to large numbers and our service starts to provide that credible information on some of the key third parties in the system. Ultimately, then we then lead to generating an implementation plan for the, the company involved, whether it's you, one of your regional offices, a third party that you deal with. What are the priority areas that you should be addressing? What are the highest risk areas that we see from a management system standpoint? And that really creates the framework for improvement. So that again, as Leslie mentioned, measure and improve. You can't improve what you don't measure, and this program gives you a way to come up with a credible, scalable way to start to measure large numbers of companies. Leslie, anything you want to add on this? No, I think you covered it quite well. Thank you, Leslie and Craig, for the informative insights. After hearing what Leslie and Craig had to share on local and global anti-corruption implications and detailed information about third parties and red flags to be aware of, let's go over how corruption can increase risk within supply chains and see how aligning people, process, and technology can help allow for mitigating corruption and bribery risk while allowing for true transparency within your value chains. When delivering supply chain intelligence and providing supplier data collection and analysis that support regulatory compliance, sustainability, and social responsibility initiatives, you are able to be given the opportunity to really examine your own supply chain and see where there might be issues of possible corruption and bribery. As both Leslie and Craig explained, corruption and bribery can happen anywhere within your value chain. Suppliers within your supply chain are open areas of risk to you and your organization if you do not know who you are doing business with. Which brings us to something we call a hybrid theory on compliance. Any sort of compliance program is complex. Understanding the many moving parts that comes with an anti-corruption compliance program is really the base for creating a process that works. For many companies that deal with large supply chains and mountains of information Having the tools necessary to make sense of it all is really the key of getting quality data to work for you. What this means is getting a, a substantial amount of information and having the ability to piece data points together to unravel key intelligence that can uncover areas of risk. But what many seem to forget is technology, although robust in its own way, still very limited in what it can really do for compliance professionals, especially when it comes to anti-corruption and anti-bribery compliance initiatives. Having a technology is great and truly simplifies things and brings order to large amounts of information, but increasing the technology's output by providing skilled experts and diligent process will enhance how effective your company's focus is when it comes to these compliance requirements. As Craig and Leslie explained with their seven key categories, the foundation needs to be set within the organization to fully understand what is needed from an external perspective, for example, for supply chains. Of course, after this is identified by the efforts from CREATE and source intelligence experts, our hybrid theory takes effect in minimizing your exposure and risk from a technological perspective aligned with the expert insights of dedicated service professionals. In this slide, you will see how effective aligning these pieces can be in maintaining visibility within your supply chain when it is in regard to anti-corruption and anti-bribery compliance. Looking how these components work seamlessly with each other, the concept here is that one segment of this activity picks up where the other leaves off. Taking a look at process, we can already understand that operations and your organization's business process play key factors in approaching anti-corruption compliance. These processes, coupled with available toolkits, online resources, and audit-ready documentation help in identifying the efforts that are being made and the efforts that need to be taken care of in the event an issue arises. In order to have these processes take effect on a grander scale, technology and the cloud-based component to compliance begin to play huge roles. Think of technology as having a large hub of information that is readily available to use in the event that you or your organization feels that risk is of concern with one of your third-party business partners. The data collected here is used to analyze the level of risk and can help validate a business decision. 
Although we have mountains of data, having the human element to understand and piece these points together falls on a well-informed data analyst that can see threats within the data that is collected. Although the technology piece is growing and can identify itself as a legitimate component in collecting and storing the necessary data to identify risk, people within this process become a level of security and can validate what technology has deemed a risk area. So the concept of aligning these areas and these three elements, people, process, and technology, is quickly enabling organizations to piece together the necessary parts to combat corruption. As I mentioned before, each one feeds off each other and ultimately helps the organization keep track and stay ahead of corruption and bribery risk. Hence, the hybrid theory on compliance. So what is good data? Of course, using data to fight corruption in supply chains is crucial. An effective operations platform is perfectly poised to manage upstream and downstream data and convert that data into reliable points of business points of business interest to effectively monitor and reduce risk. Of course, establishing trusting relationships with third parties to effectively get this reliable data is definitely needed, which is why the people component within this hybrid theory of compliance is also very crucial. So constant raw data is funneled into systems to be analyzed for any outlying anomalies that could promote risk. As you look at the, at the image here, you see the technology platform lays dead center. We have source intelligence customers that we work with very closely, along with their suppliers and their distributors, their brokers and their agents, all transferring data within this technology platform. What this means is since raw data is going through the platform, we have analysts, we have technology, of course, analyzing this data and making sure that anything that comes through is of little to no risk to anyone that is trying to have an anti-corruption compliance program. So now we see a seamless information gathering, we see active data on the platform, and then we see continuous monitoring for potential exposures of risk, human or technology. Of course, we understand that suppliers, distributors, brokers, and agents all have different levels of risk. But of course, some are much more risk than others. As Leslie and Craig had mentioned, those areas of risk, of course, have to be weighed and measured on a human element. But although the technology platform plays an important role, our analysts therefore analyze this data, take into account anything that is going on on a regional basis, and inform those that are going to be of risk with regard to their suppliers, their distributors, brokers, and agents. So of course, data, process, and technology all play a single important role to make sure that anti-corruption compliance can truly be effective in any organization's compliance program. So when we look at the six elements that really contribute to making sure that compliance is measured and looked at in a way that enforces a quality level of compliance monitoring, we look at scope, assessing, reviewing, a due diligence, educating, and monitor and review type of system that encompasses everything that comes from a compliance program. Identifying scope, you identify third parties who fall under the anti-corruption rules and regulations. This allows you to kind of build a barrier and see what is it that you fall under for rules and regulations, what your third parties fall under, and of course what your suppliers, since they are a part of your third parties, fall under as well. Then assessing your third parties. You want to assess your third parties, which means you want to engage your third parties. Making sure your third parties understand that your anti-corruption compliance program is just as important internally as it is externally. Your third parties need to understand this. They need to abide by this in order for you to minimize your level of risk with anyone you do business with. So reviewing the data surrounding third parties. The data is constantly coming in through our technology platform. In order to understand this data, you need to review it. And then this data, of course, is going to ultimately open up the door of either less or more risk. The data that is collected and then, of course, reviewed is going to allow you to make a crucial business decision to whether or not extend the opportunity to that third party, continue doing business with that third party, or ultimately end this business relationship due to the fact that it opens up risk for you. Next is due diligence. Conducting risk assessments using the data collected. 
What this means is, as mentioned by Craig and Leslie, the due diligence factor plays a huge role in making sure that you understand the possible risks in doing business globally and doing business with third parties in other parts of the world. Companies are always exposed to risk, but making sure you trim down that risk by assessing the data that comes in is crucial, again, for any other business decision that you make on behalf of your company. Again, understanding that businesses that you work with are in part representing you overseas is something that is very crucial for organizations to understand and also for third parties to understand. Next, we have educate. Education are key elements in making sure that you have done your due diligence and your third parties understand how serious you are about bribery and corruption. Education plays key roles in making sure that they understand where you come from and what stance you have on bribery and corruption within your organization internally. It also gives way that you are being proactive in supplying the necessary data, necessary education, and necessary pain points that identify what you deem is corruption and bribery. So developing a complete and uh, education system and tracking that education and the awareness programs for not just your internal processing and not just for your internal employees, but also for your external parties is a major part in making sure that your risks are lower and that your exposure is also lowered in the same effect. And lastly, we have monitor and review. Continuous monitoring process to track third-party performance. We track third-party performance in order to make sure that the educational pieces that we offer them are being taken seriously and we're able to prove that the business partners that we deal with understand our internal procedures and they take seriously what our organization finds to be unethical business practice. This also means monitoring data that comes in from any other news outlet, from any other region around the world that might identify your third party that you're doing business with as a level of risk. This constant level of review and monitor allows your business to make sure that you are being compliant and you are well aware of what is happening outside of your organization in other parts of the world. Engagement of suppliers and tracing the supply chain activity combined with advanced data analytics with powerful visual reporting tools helps to gain insights into operational efficiencies and spot potential exposures to risk. Here, the level and amount of information that is consistently being stored and analyzed is used to properly measure your exposure and alert you if any activity is unusual, either through the technology platform or through the assessed process of the corruption data analyst. Overall, combining the best of cloud-based technology and a sophisticated engagement team, which allows you to provide scalability, flexibility, and the expertise needed to turn supply chain data into something both meaningful and actionable is very much needed within any compliance industry. As we conclude, I would like to thank Leslie and Craig for joining us on this webinar and really discussing how corruption and third parties can affect any business or organization globally. As a reminder, if you joined us late, this webinar recording and slides will be available online for review at sourceintelligence.com forward slash webinar library. Questions asked through the GoToWebinar control panel will receive responses shortly after this webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email education at sourceintelligence.com. Also, if you're interested in more information, please check out our upcoming white paper library, which is located on our Source Intelligence webpage. This is Devin Simonson with Source Intelligence. As always, thank you for joining us and have yourself a great rest of your day.